Dr. Zainab Yilmaz is a neurogeneticist whose research focuses on the genetics of eating disorders. She's an assistant professor of psychiatry and genetics at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and she was the featured presenter at Sigma Xi's monthly pizza lunch, which is typically on the final Tuesday of each month and is currently being held virtually via Zoom. I'm Brian Mallow, and following Dr. Yilmaz's talk, which was about anorexia nervosa, I had the opportunity to interview her. I began by asking about her background. My undergraduate degree at the University of Toronto was in psychology. And um, even then I was interested in research on body image and social comparison and eating disorders. And after that, I decided to take um, a few years off um, to see what I wanted to do for grad school. And I had an opportunity to work as a clinical research coordinator in eating disorders um, back in Toronto again in Canada. And during this time, you know, trying to figure out what I want to do, um, I worked on a number of projects, some of which were genetic actually, um, that contributed some of the samples um, to our genetic study um, results, which I just pre um, presented, and um, other biological studies. And during that time, I became very interested in the genetic underpinnings. I was not really familiar with the fact that eating disorders um, had a genetic basis. And that is a question I get from people when I tell them that I work on the genetics of eating disorders. It is not very well known that these are heritable conditions. And you know, at that point, I decided that you know, as opposed to a more clinical path, and I have utmost respect for clinicians, I figured that I could be helpful um, in different ways. And you know, understanding the biological underpinnings could also down the path help patients um, with you know, understanding what is going on and um, identifying people who are at risk. So my PhD, I did lab work looking at, again, the uh, genetics of actually weight regulation and eating disorders. And as a part of my postdoc, I decided to kind of transition from wet lab to doing analyses. And during this period, psychiatric genetics has really exploded. Um, you know, a decade ago, we knew very, very little about the psychiatric genetic, you know, um, field as a whole. But we have discovered so much about this, uh, the genetic underpinnings of many psychiatric disorders with schizophrenia so far leading the way and other disorders um, kind of catching up. So um, if that answers your question, I mean, I've been kind of in this field in and out in different paths um, in a very flexible way, but um, I became interested in the genetics part of it later in career as I kept you know, working as a clinical research coordinator and saw all the suffering um, that the patients experience, the frustrations that the clinicians have, and you know, the fact that I learned that there was a biological basis and it would be good for us to understand that. Yeah, that's a very fascinating topic that I'd actually like to start with because uh, although our Sigma Xi audience is, they're not all geneticists, but uh, largely uh, scientists, but um, this is available to a broader audience and I'm not a geneticist and mm -hmm. I'm not a scientist at all. So I have a very lay person's understanding of some of this. <clears throat> and like you said, it's very hard to wrap your mind around the idea that genes can control certain kinds of behaviors. And maybe some make more sense than others, but, but it's hard to understand that. Mm -hmm. um, you did say that, that the genetic underpin, that it's, you said that we'll probably never be able to nail down precise connections between genes and behavior, but, but how can that even happen? How can, are, and what kind of genes are they? Somebody asked if, uh, are they metabolic genes that you're looking at? What are the sorts of genes you're looking at that might be related? And how can genes possibly cause this sort of behavior? Well, if you think about it, most of the differences that we observe, you know, among different human beings, there is some sort, in many instances, there is some sort of a genetic underpinning. Um, this varies, you know, depending on what we're looking at. But um, one thing I want to make very clear as a geneticist is that at no point in time um, are we advocating a genetic um, deterministic point of view. So just because somebody has risk genes for any disorder, be it anorexia, anorexia nervosa or anything else, it does not necessarily mean that they will develop that disorder. Um, you know, I studied that part of the puzzle specifically, but it is not the only part of the puzzle. Um, environment plays a very important role. And, um, you know, you can think of this as a quote unquote perfect storm. All of the risk factors have to come together in one way or another in some combination for these um, disorders or for these traits to be expressed. So just because somebody has the risk genes present does not mean that they will definitely develop anorexia nervosa. So I wanna mention that um, in terms of, um, you know, kind of understanding the genetic underpinnings of many different traits, 
Um, one thing we're learning, as I mentioned, is that we will never find the gene or a handful of genes. It's going to be um, hundreds, if not thousands, if not tens, tens of thousands of genes that you know, taken together increase the risk, but each gene only plays a little bit of role in increasing the risk. So this will be a cumulative effect. And what we're also seeing is that um, since, you know, there are millions of human traits out there and only 20 to 25,000 genes, there will never be a gene that is responsible for one thing. But many genes will play a role in a variety of different traits. So um, the example I gave was, hypothetically speaking, the genes that may be responsible for obsessionality may also be responsible for perfectionism and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, the picture is definitely very complex. Um, we're just beginning to make a dent here. And in terms of the eight genome-wide significant hits that we have identified, um, we looked at um, what these variants are or what, uh, what kind of genes um, reside in these areas a little bit more closely. Some of them span hundreds of genes. Some of them are a smaller number of genes. But when we kind of looked at whether these genetic regions have been previously implicated genome-wide association studies of other traits, um, we came up with roughly four different categories. And I had a slide on this, which I had to remove for time um, constraints. But um, very crudely, we could look at four separate categories. The first one was autoimmune conditions. So some of the genetic um, regions that were implicated in AN risk in our study have previously come up in GWASs of a number of autoimmune conditions. The second category was metabolic. Um, so again, um, traits such as BMI and obesity and HDL cholesterol. And then the third one was neuropsychiatric disorders, which should not be very surprising. And then the last one, again, I crudely categorized this. Um, it, I put it as sex hormones, but um, it had to do with age of monarchy. You know, at this point, it is too early to really speculate what this means. We need a lot of follow-up studies and much larger sample sizes in order to understand. And um, we, will, we were on the path to discover many more genes, which will present us with a much better picture. But right now, based on what we know, um, it appears that there could be some overlapping pathways um, between anorexia nervosa and these four categories. We just need to research them a little bit better in the future. One thing that you pointed out <clears throat> early in your presentation was that uh, despite maybe what some people think, anorexia nervosa is not <clears throat> limited to, uh, uh, to any gender or other matters, but there is, you said it occurs 90% in females over males. So that's a pretty significant difference. And I'm not a scientist, I'm not a geneticist, very much naive armchair geneticist question. Mm -hmm. um, my inclination would be to say, to, to wonder if that's um, cultural, um, but of course that could easily be genetic as well. But, but how do you even address that? 90% female cases, what does that mean to you in terms of the genetic and the environmental factors? Yeah, that's a great question. And we don't quite know the answer um, that could you know, give you a satisfactory answer. But um, first of all, um, male patients also exist. And there's a lot of stigma that is, that is attached to being a patient with anorexia nervosa to begin with. But there's also the stigma in our culture is that men don't suffer from eating disorders. And this results in, we believe, serious underreporting of the number of male cases as they are less likely to um, seek treatment um, for their disorder. But what we know from clinical studies is that men who have AN, um, their anorexia nervosa experience tends to be earlier age of onset and more severe in nature. And um, you know, genetically, it's very difficult to tell what this means. So far, we haven't found anything on the X chromosome that may be associated with risk. But um, again, I had to cut this um, because of time constraints. But one thing we can do is um, we can kind of look at whether the genetic architecture of AN is similar between female and male participants. And in this case, um, this was the first GWAS of AN that had male participants. We did not have many of them. It was only 451. But with our very limited sample size, we did not see any evidence uh, so far suggesting that the genetic architecture may be different between the two sexes. Too early to say much, to be honest. I mean, 450 individuals is not that much. But hopefully, as we keep recruiting individuals for our eating disorder studies, we intend to have um, more male participants, cases, and controls. And I think the only way that we could address this in a meaningful, a meaningful way would be um, to have more male participants so that we can actually study this phenomenon a lot more um, carefully in men than in women. I wonder, and again, maybe if this is a naive question, forgive me, but uh, is, since we're discussing this as a disorder and the negative consequences of AN, um, 
is there some way in which it's possibly if there's uh, a genetic underpinning to it um, mm -hmm. is it adaptive in some sense is there anything are there any associations that are positive that are thrown into this whole mix yeah that is very hard to answer you know um it's it's hard to know we don't quite know right now um if there are certain adaptive features of it because if you think about it on the surface um this this does not sound adaptive for survival at all right um, and, you know, coming back to the sex differences, actually, um, one thing I want to point out, since you mentioned the sociocultural factors, um, even if the same genes are present, just because of the cultural influences, the way those genes are expressed could be different between the two sexes, right? Since there's, I mean, granted, men are under a lot of pressure to look a certain way in this day and age, too, but this is a lot more um, kind of amplified in the case of uh, females. So that could be another thing. But um, coming back to uh, your question, um, in this case, and I've been rambling, so I started to forget it anyway, so if you wouldn't mind just reminding me. <laughs> that happens, unfortunately. With me too, yeah. <laughs> so, um, in this case, um, could you remind me of the question, please? <laughs> oh, just um, that, it, like, is there anything adaptive? Are there any oh, right, associations right, right. that are surprising? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I get so passionate that I actually kind of keep going on um, about the topic. So thanks for reminding me. It's difficult to know. But, um, you know, from a genetic perspective, if a trait is not super relevant to survival, um, you know, and 1% is on a very, very, very high rate, um, you know, it's possible that evolution does not necessarily touch it because it's not that important. Whereas something that may be a lot more important for survival may be under higher, you know, pressure for selection. That is just the theory. The answer is we don't know. Um, if I were to speculate, and I just want to make it clear, this is pure speculation. Um, we know that um, individuals with anorexia nervosa tend to be more perfectionistic in nature. Um, so one could argue that, especially in the culture that we live in, those uh, could be certain benefits to an individual. Um, again, this is just very widely speculating. Biologically, it is very difficult to come up with anything based on what we know. Um, so. I, I wish I had a clearer answer to your question, but at this point, I think we really don't know what could potentially be adaptive about this behavior. What do we know about the occurrence of AN uh, through time and across different cultures? Right. And in your studies, have your controls been varied across different cultures as well? Or I, I know the studies haven't probably been mm -hmm. that big yet, but yeah, do we, do we have any information, any data on that? So starting with different age groups, um, eating disorders tend to start um, right after puberty. Although nowadays, you know, we see patients as young as seven or eight years old um, coming with diagnoses of eating disorders. So they can start pretty early. Um, they tend to peak around, you know, teens, late teens, early 20s. But um, there are also a lot of research studies done showing that after midlife too, there seems to be, you know, a high number of individuals who go on to develop an eating disorder. So, um, you know, it will be kind of, um, very simplistic to look at them just as, you know, disorders of youth, because we know that does not appear to be the case, um, for instance. And coming back to different cultures, that's always an interesting question. Um, the results are varying among different eating disorders. And this is a paper that I enjoyed reading very much back in 2003 um, was when it was published. And um, two researchers that I admire very much did this very thorough study um, looking at whether eating disorders are culture-bound syndromes. And what they did was they looked at all kinds of historical, um, historical records um, for um, descriptions of you know, conditions that may sound like anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa and so on and so forth. And in the case of anorexia nervosa, you can go to 14th, 15th century. We're stretching the definition a little bit, but if you think about the fasting girls, um, like you know, St. Catherine of Siena, who would you know, starve herself um, you know, in the name of you know, dedication to religious, religion in that case, you know, there are a number of aspects that resemble anorexia nervosa. Can we necessarily say it's the same disorder? No, but, you know, could it be also affected by the culture that we live in, the way that is manifested? Um, we don't know. But they were able to pinpoint um, cases, even, you know, going back to 19th to early 20th century um, hospital records in London, England. And their estimate was that the rates were also around 1% lifetime prevalence, which is not that different from what we see. And um, so far, I think, as limited as is, there is evidence suggesting that 
the rates of anorexia and nervosa may not have significantly increased over the decades. We just hear about it more. You know, it's difficult to know, but that seems to be the pattern we see. Whereas in the case of other eating disorders, so bulimia nervosa and purging disorder uh, or binge eating disorder, there has been a significant increase in their prevalence rates in the last few decades. And um, there are cultural studies done in countries like Fiji and the uh, bringing of the uh, Western TV series. And with the Western series um, you know, being introduced, they reported an increased uh, prevalence of um, especially bulimia nervosa and binge eating and other eating disorders. So it's, it's a complex question, but um, you know, in the case of anorexia nervosa, we don't know. Um, my evidence is a little dated, but it may not be as culture bound, whereas in the case of other eating disorders, they may be a bigger cultural component. You did mention that uh, you want to make it clear that we can't just uh, categorize it as like a juvenile or youthful disorder, but um, is there an age, and you mentioned a fairly young age, but is there an age at which a young age that it's appropriate to start diagnosing uh, AN? And also, are there any occurrences late in life? Does it, is, does it ever happen to someone who definitely didn't suffer from it and until a later, later point in life? Right. So um, again, I'm not a clinician, so I will not be able to directly answer in terms of what age would be the minimal for diagnosis. Um, I, I'm not as familiar with the um, criteria for children, but um, as I mentioned, I mean, I've heard from my colleagues back when I was in Toronto, um, you know, diagnosing cases as early as seven or eight. I'm, I'm assuming there are certain things that they would have to rule out that are associated with you know, childhood eating related um, behaviors. But coming back to your question about their emergence in later life, yeah, there are cases out there where an individual may not have had a diagnosis of an eating disorder, but they meet criteria you know, in their 40s, 50s, and even later in life. Um, it's very difficult to say whether they had other kinds of you know, um, dysfunctional attitudes or behaviors you know, when it comes to eating and weight and shape. Um, that's very difficult to pinpoint because those tend to be pretty pervasive in our culture to begin with. But um, you know, there are a lot of cases in which there were no diagnoses prior to, uh, prior to much later in life. So that definitely happens as well. Um, you know, eating disorders do not discriminate based on age, sex, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, race, culture. Um, they're pretty pervasive. Yes. I, so um, in a moment, I'm going to take some questions from our viewing chatters. But uh, just one or two quick ones. You just, you mentioned the exposure of other cultures to Western television mm -hmm. and then the occurrence. So I just, you said there's really no, no effective treatments, that it's underfunded. Um, actually tied to this, do you think that one of the reasons it's underfunded um, is like a prejudice against, because it largely occurs in females, that, that there's a, an imbalance there? Um, and, and, and maybe that's related to why it hasn't been funded mm -hmm. and studied as well. But, but because of that, I understand that we don't know that much. Right. Um, but without effective treatments yet, I suppose, what about psychiatric interventions? And the first thing I thought of is like, I don't know how you do this. How do you prevent exposure to mm -hmm. mass media when it's such a integral part of our right. lives today. But um, I wonder what's at least discussed around those areas. Yeah, so just to start with, you know, the stigma, I think, you know, you really hit the nail right on the head. It is a very big problem with eating disorders. A lot of individuals and sometimes, you know, general practitioners, um, they don't quite understand. And there's always a lot of patient blaming and family blaming back in the day as well. Um, whereas in reality, we know that individuals do not choose to have an eating disorder. Um, this is a very serious condition. And um, families are also um, the uh, clinician's best allies. They are really not necessarily to blame in this battle. It's, it's very difficult, you know, it must be very difficult to see a loved um, family member suffering from an eating disorder. And, um, you know, the stigma really doesn't help with um, A, funding and B, you know, um, getting more funding uh, and, you know, more effective treatments out there for people to overcome the barriers to um, actually seek treatment. So, Stigma is definitely a very big issue that we have been facing. And we also see cultural stigma as well. So outside of our culture too, um, one thing that I did not quite point out is that so far the genome-wide association studies uh, that we have done have been with European ancestry populations. Um, this has mostly been because of convenience. Uh, when we kind of collected samples that have been existing in people's labs um, or freezers, um, you know, most of the Western countries were able to produce samples. 
Um, and in other cultures, the stigma may be even a bigger issue. And, um, you know, that may really prevent individuals from seeking treatment. And um, one of the goals that we have as a part of our future genetic studies is to make our samples a lot more diverse. Um, so far, they have been European, both cases and controls. But we need the entire world in some way to participate in this. And we have to make this a more global effort so that we can truly understand the genetic underpinnings um, of these disorders. And in terms of, you know, watching TV, what can we do about this? Um, you know, there's not a whole lot that we can do, unfortunately, with the culture that we exist in. It's very unfortunate that we are bombarded with these messages that you have to look a certain way, I mean, especially women, and then followed um, by you know, ads that really sell us these calorically dense, you know, delicious foods. And you get a lot of you know, these contradicting messages. Um, you know, again, I just want to point out that the genetic basis really um, becomes more evident when we think about it, because in the culture that we live, um, you know, it's, if, if there was no genetic component, I would assume that most women would have some kind of a full-blown eating disorder, right? Um, because these messages are very pervasive. But the fact that, you know, the rates haven't changed, especially in the case of anorexia nervosa, really suggests that there could be some differences between, you know, body dissatisfaction and disordered eating and a full-blown eating disorder. So we don't quite know if these happen on a continuum yet or, you know, the full eating disorders are uh, distinct entities. But um, you know, with the culture that we work in, um, you know, that's, I guess, where the family, other environmental factors and genes come into play, if that makes sense. It does. And given our current situation, do you uh, have any thoughts on whether isolation and social mm -hmm. distancing can affect disorders such as anorexia? Nervosa? Yeah, there have been a number of articles that have been written on this. And um, unfortunately, it will likely um, make things worse for a lot of patients. Um, isolation is not good for any of us. This is, I mean, these are very unusual times. And um, for someone who may need, you know, social support, um, it will make it a lot more difficult. Um, you know, when we're idle, our minds wander. And in the case of individuals with either current eating disorders or who are recovering, this may be more pr profound in terms of anxiety, depression. And also, um, if they're adhering to a specific diet after, you know, recovery, not being able to find those food items, um, not being able to grocery shop, that may lead to you know, certain levels of restriction, uh, restriction and other things as well. And as a matter of fact, um, our group is launching a um, US-based, I don't know if it's international, but at least US-based study looking at the effects of COVID-19 in patients with eating disorders. So you know, hopefully we will have a much better understanding of um, the ramifications of this global pandemic and how it affects patients with eating disorders. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. And I'm going to take some questions from the chat. And if uh, and it's not too late, if any viewers want to send in questions, uh, just put them in the chat. But um, earlier, Betty Sue Masters asked, she said, excellent presentation, first thank of you. all. And could you please uh, for me define this um, acronym that you use? She says, does your wider GWAS study mm -hmm. reflect the same chromosomal location as the smaller cohort of 3000 plus? Um, the same cohort, yes. So what we were able to do was um, we just added more samples to our previous cohort of the 3,500 cases and 11,000 controls. So one of the most important things in scientific studies in general is, um, you know, sample size. It is very important. So in this case, um, you know, we multiplied it by like white, um, I think over five times. And um, it definitely did include the samples that were included in the previous GWAS, although it was just a fraction of our total sample size. So yes, we did include the same individuals. And, and Betty Sue Masters also asked, uh, the anorexia nervosa BMI, body max <laughs> index relationship, suggests that early regimens of nutrition and activity could be influential. Potentially, yes. Um, those are questions to which we don't have good answers yet. But, um, you know, there are a lot of things, as I mentioned, we can't control for. But um, those could definitely be important factors as well. But I think when combined with genetic findings, um, there appears to be at least something that is metabolic going on here as well that we have to be mindful of. Definitely. Judith Bond asked if there are any studies of the gastrointestinal microbiome mm -hmm. in AN patients. Yes, actually at UNC, um, Cynthia Bulick has been the leading expert in this. Um, there have been a number of studies looking at um, microbiome of patients with anorexia nervosa. This is not my expertise. Again, I just want to put that disclaimer out there. But there have been studies um, showing that if um, we were to take the um, microbiome of um, uh, quote-unquote mice with anorexia nervosa, um, and, and if you were to put this in a regular mouse, um, what 
they see is this you know, profound weight loss. So there appears to be something definitely happening in the gut. The brain-gut connection is very important. And it is influenced by a lot of things. So it is difficult to study that as a snapshot. But we are definitely seeing um, an influence of the gut microbiome and um, its role on eating disorders. And there are future studies in our group happening um, to look at this more closely for not just anorexia nervosa, but other eating disorders as well. So most definitely, yes, there appears to be a connection. And Dina asks, are there ethnic differences in AN or any SNPs that, associate, that are associated with particular ethnic groups? Right, um, that's a good question. And we don't quite know, as I mentioned, so first and foremost, um, our populations have been European so much uh, so far. Uh, keep in mind that there's a lot of genetic variation among European populations as well. One example that you know, we were taught in grad school was that individuals who come from southern Italy are actually notably different from northern Italy when it comes to um, nucleotide uh, uh, frequencies. And one thing that we do as a part of genome-wide association studies is that we control for population stratification and ancestral differences in order to make sure that none of the findings that we see between cases and controls are caused by any ancestral issues. And um, not to get too technical, but with our GWASs, we analyze each cohort separately. So if we have a sample um, cases and controls that come from Finland, they are first analyzed separately. And the same applies for United Kingdom, United States. And then we meta-analyze all of the results together. Um, to see, you know, what the general picture looks like. And there are other methods that we could apply um, to see whether we see any profound cohorts effects that may be skewing results uh, one way or another. And so far, um, again, I didn't have the, the time to talk about all of these, but our research so far suggests that our results are pretty consistent across the cohorts that have been included in our study so far. We will be very interested in seeing um, how these apply to non-European ancestry populations in the future. Well, this has been a lot of information in the past hour. I wonder if you could uh, uh, leave us with uh, your takeaway. What, what's, uh, what, what directions are you hoping to move into with your research? And what do you want us to know, scientists and non-scientists right. alike? What would you like us to know about AI? So takeaway messages, if you could just simplify this to a few sentences. Um, I would say that first and foremost, um, eating disorders are very serious conditions that are under, underfunded. And um, because of the stigma that is attached, um, you know, there are a lot of issues that are associated with individuals seeking help, um, you know, families um, being blamed and whatnot. So first and foremost, we have to understand that these are serious conditions and they're not done by choice. And um, we need to be supportive of individuals who have um, these conditions and fight the stigma as hard as possible. The second one is just like other psychiatric disorders, they run in families. And um, the next one is, I think the point that I really try to hammer in is that there appears to be a metabolic component, genetically speaking at least, uh, to anorexia nervosa. So it is not only a psychiatric disorder, but the metabolic component may play a different and a very important role um, that we have not quite thought about. And then the next would be, in terms of future directions, is our goal is to continue with this line of research, among others, obviously. Um, and we are in the works of increasing our sample size to much higher numbers, and um, including more male patients and more diverse populations. And it is also our intention to, as our sample sizes increase, work with other um, scientists in other fields so that we can take a much closer look at what exactly we're looking at. GWAS is a you know, pretty blunt tool. You know, we're looking at gene discovery, but we can't really talk a lot about the underlying pathways. And I think in the future, there will be a lot more studies that will try to understand what is really going on underneath. So those are our main future research directions. Excellent. And if somebody would like to find you, do you have any social media presence that you'd like to point us to or any other or any resources? Uh, that um, absolutely. Recommend? So um, first and foremost, you can Google me. <laughs> um, there will be information on the UNC web page. And in, in addition to that, um, UNC Center of Excellence for Eating Disorders, uh, UNC, C-E-E-D, um, is on Twitter. And also I do have a Twitter handle that I included in the slides, um, which would be uh, Z Yilma, so my first initial last name, PhD. Um, so you can also follow my tweets there as well. Um, and you can always look up the publications and you're welcome to email me if you have any questions or you know, if you need any references for any of the papers that I talked about, I'd be happy to provide those. Well, thank you very much for joining us and thank you to everyone who tuned in. Um, I think I'll turn this over to Fenella if you have any final words, but this uh, is the once a month Pizza Lunch, sponsored by Sigma Zion, also co-presented by the Science Communicators of North Carolina. Um, great presentation, says Barbara. 
Thank you. And um, Vanilla, any final words? Thanks, Brian. A great interview there. Thank you again, Zainab. We appreciate your time so much. Um, yeah, so I just want to say thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, the next one will be next month, but well, actually later this month because this got moved back. So it'll be the 28th of April, which will probably also be virtual, but we'll keep you posted. Look for our event bright invites, and we appreciate you sticking with us, even though we have to go virtual. So everybody, please stay safe and join us, and we appreciate your participation.